Okay, good morning. We continue um, with a panel. I'm very, very excited about this project. My name is Nicole Willett. I'm the Director of Education for the Mars Society, and I would like to introduce our panel members. This panel will be discussing the upcoming virtual reality projects that can support the Mars Society's goals to excite the public about sending humans to Mars, as well as support STEM and computer science education. The Mars Society's Mars VR program will soon be releasing its phase one VR environment, which is focused on creating a complete simulation of the Mars Desert Research Station that we just heard about in Utah for training, to help in uh, training its crews. James Burke is the IT director for the Mars Society and a software project manager, formerly with Mar Microsoft. He manages the Mars Virtual Reality Project. Shannon Norrell is the director of engineering for Mars VR and a VR expert. He co-founded the HP Mars Home Planet Contest and formerly worked in the CTO's office at HP as well as Apple and Microsoft. Jeff Dillon is a senior engineer with Unity, which is the VR and game development platform that we are using for the Mars VR project. Eric Stowers is a graduate student at Texas A&M School of Engineering and is working on Spacecraft VR, which he will talk about today. That project is led by former astronaut Dr. Greg Chamatoff, which is also an advisor on our Mars VR project. The Mars VR team and the folks at Texas A&M are working together to share resources and assets between both projects. Welcome. So it was about a year ago that I had the opportunity to lead a tour of the Mars Society at JPL. And we were able to see what JPL was doing in the ops lab with the Curiosity rover uh, HoloLens project. And it was recently featured on the Von Karman lecture series. You can check that out. But I got to see it about a year ago. And I was put on the VR headset. I was walking around next to the Curiosity rover that day that day's data, it was crystal clear. And I thought to myself, I'm really lucky to see this, but I wanna bring this stuff to the public. I want to see an experience like this in museums. And I came back to Seattle, I called up the Museum of Flight, which is our local air and space museum, and I said, how can I help you guys do something like this? Um, and they were interested, uh, I've been working with them ever since. I talked to Dr. Zubrin, uh, who I've worked with for 20 years, about how could we, the Mars Society, do something serious with VR. And he said, why don't we start by scanning the MDRS and create a virtual reality environment we could use to train the crews so that before they come out to the MDRS, they know where everything is and they know how to go through the airlock and how to put on their suits. I said, that's a great idea. So I talked to Dr. Rupert, who was just on the stage before us, and this gentleman, Shannon Norell, uh, and a couple other folks, Marcus Anzengruber was one person on that call. And we decided to work on the environment that we're uh, almost done with today that's out on the floor of the convention. And we'll be featuring that tonight at the banquet in more detail. So um, it's been a really great ride. We did a Kickstarter in May. Our goal was to raise $25,000, and we raised 31000 and uh, shortly after the Kickstarter began, I got an email from this guy, and he said, hey, I'm a former astronaut, and I'm the professor of engineering at Texas A&M, and we've been working on VR stuff for space for two years. We should work together. So I said, great, let's do it. And so now we're working with Dr. Shamatoff and his uh, team to, uh, to work together to use the models they've created, and they're going to use our MDRS trained models in their project. So it's been a great partnership so far. And that's just one of the many partnerships we, we've started off doing this year. Um, we've been able to get donated software licenses, donated VR hardware. Basically, anybody I talk to in the VR industry about this project gets really excited because there, there's a need for applications in the VR industry. And telling the story of Humans to Mars and what we're doing at the MDRS is a great fit for VR. So. Um, so we're, there's going to be a floor demo that we've had. I hope you guys can all come check it out after this. We'll have it in more detail tonight. And then, um, I, as I mentioned, I'm working with the Museum of Flight in Seattle. We're going to do a big 
event in November. Dr. Zubrin is going to fly up for that. We're going to show this there and hopefully have a permanent exhibit there. And I would like to do that in a lot of museums. I would like to have this wherever we can. It's also going to be a great STEM education tool. Um, I'd love to see schools use our software. We're going to give it away. Uh, we're going to open source it. There will, there will be some mission content for the MDRS that we will uh, have available for people to purchase, the general public. But the platform itself will be free and open source. So we're hoping that this will be a big thing. Shannon? All right, so uh, I'm Shannon Norell. And uh, really, this, this, this project, the Mars VR project, came out of uh, the mind of Dr. Zubrin, in my opinion. Uh, we, we sat and we had, a, we had a talk exactly one year ago at the, the Mars Society convention down in Irvine. And, uh, you know, we were, were doing the, the HP Mars Home Planet project, which, which is, in effect, you know, all artificial. It's, it's all artificial terrain. It's uh, artificial models of, of uh, buildings and uh, transports, etc. And he posited, you know, what, what if we could actually scan a real-world environment? Let, you know... What if we could actually scan a place for people to practice, you know, doing EVAs and, and exploring terrain? And I said, well, what do you have in mind? Well, he, hey, this MDRS thing, I'm okay. Well, it's Utah. You guys all obviously know a great deal about it. And uh, why don't we use that as a, as a sort of a test bed and go out and see if we can scan, I don't know, maybe a square mile of terrain and the surrounding habitats and uh, the hab, the internals of the hab and the the lab and the uh, the RAM. Uh, what is that? Re what is yeah, that the RAM. Uh, it's a repair and this augmentation module. There we go. Yeah. I always forget. It's really it's like the workshop. It's really cool. Uh, anyhow, so I was like, wow, that's that's kind of on the verge of impossible. But let's try it. Let's go scan a square mile of terrain. I mean, the the objective is to have it so you can you can see softball sized rocks. I mean, we can't get down to the grain you know it's a grain of sand uh, level, but. Uh, heretofore, pretty much one of the largest scans ever done, uh, as far as I'm aware of. So uh, we went out to the MDRS. I spent a better part of a week in uh, July, which is not the ideal time to be there, I've learned. Uh, <laughs> it's about 1,000 degrees. Uh, but uh, anyway, brought, a, brought several large-scale drones um, um, and very a lot of different cameras and... Uh, LIDAR sensors, which is like a, a uh, well, it's LIDAR. It a gives a very detailed uh, depth map scans. And uh, we, I think we compiled a little over 20,000 photographs of the MDRS using a technique called photogrammetry. So photogrammetry lets you take a series of, of photos, photo, 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 and stitch them together, much like you've seen a panorama shot on an on a iPhone or whatever. It stitches them together. It finds common points and links them together. So from that uh, photogrammetry technique, you can, you can establish a 3D model. And so far we have relatively completed the interiors of the HAB units, of the HAB upstairs, downstairs, uh, the RAM, the uh, observatory, the uh, greenhouse uh, area at, uh, at uh, MDRS. And so th those models are kind of one thing, and we're going to add interactivity to the models where you can, say, open a door or pick up a suit and put it on type of thing. And uh, then we have another project, which is stitching together all this mass of terrain and pulling it into uh, Unity, which is a challenge because it's huge. <laughs> But you have to use some, some complicated techniques called a progressive level of detail where you don't pull in the entire model. You just pull in bits as you're, as you're close to it type of thing. So uh, it's, uh, it's pushing the envelope, which I love to be doing. And uh, let's see, what else did I want to cover? Oh, the intent of the project, as James mentioned, is to, to be an open source platform so that everyone can contribute, everyone can benefit, everybody can download and experience it at home. Uh, if you're a developer, you can, you can contribute to, so we'll have sort of like uh, tasks posted, like uh, for instance, we wanna do a, a mission to go find a piece of hematite in the, this region, in, in the Roberts Rock Garden, which is a fantastic place in that area, by the way. Uh, so, so then you could, you could take on tasks and contribute to the open source community to
basically build missions for everyone to, to uh, enjoy. So um, that's about it for me, I guess. And we're going we're gonna to go into quite more detail uh, later on. Oh, and the, the Greg Chamatop thing with uh, you guys, the spacecraft is really going to play an important part. He, I guess you're going to have some slides and some over stuff to show us. So, okay. Yep. All right. Thanks. Jeff? Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Dillon. I'm with Unity Technologies. I'm a senior engineer there. Um, I'm a brand new member of the Mars Society, and this is my first, I'm sure, of many uh, convention visits, so it's a pleasure to be here. So um, we're excited to partner with the Mars Society and be, uh, you know, uh, working with on the Mars VR experience. Uh, I'm, I'm glad they chose Unity as their, their platform of choice. There, there are other uh, options out there. I'm, I'm glad you're flying with, with Unity today. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I believe one of the main reasons they chose Unity is the great developer community around Unity, uh, you know, around the, yeah. the platform. Um, there's many uh, developers currently using Unity. Uh, you might know Unity as the number one game platform in the world. Uh, most games, more than half of the games in the world are built on the Unity game platform. So Unity has been moving into other markets recently. Uh, virtual reality, as you're aware of, um, is, is, a good, is a big push for the company. Um, I actually do some work at the, at the company around VR and also machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, what we're uh, really excited about. Um, not, another vertical is uh, simulation. Uh, that's a big market that we're moving into, specifically uh, the automotive vertical and self-driving cars and the algorithms around that. And also in the film industry, uh, developing films um, within the, the Unity platform. Um, can't really say too much about that, but you'll be hearing some announcements soon um, regarding some partnerships with uh, Microsoft and Disney around that, so stay tuned for that. Um, for some of the, the capabilities of Unity, you might want to do a Google search for Atom and Unity, and uh, you'll find uh, some short video clips of uh, a, uh, a scene that we've developed that uh, ha it shows a, 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 the concept is a human that wakes up like with amnesia, but realizes that he's in a robotic body. And uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, sequence, so you might want to check that out. Um, we're looking to add um, one of the projects I'm excited about, I know I'm getting off track a little bit, but um, one of the projects I'm excited about is adding a simulation of self-awareness to Adam inside a virtual reality environment. So that um, is, is quite promising. But again, we're really excited to partner with the Mars Society and just looking forward to what this project can, can do. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So Eric's going to come up to the podium. He's got a couple slides to show about the Texas A&M work and the spacecraft VR project. Hi, everybody. Hmm. Hello. Hi. How are y'all? Uh, so my name's Eric. I am uh, working with Dr. Chamatoff in, at Texas A&M in his lab. Uh, his lab falls under the Astro Center at Texas A&M, uh, which the overall goal of that center is to advance the uh, aerospace technology research and operations, uh, and just improve the field in general. Uh, this is some of our leadership and our advisors. A lot of our advisors do come from NASA. So spacecraft uh, is partnering with Mars VR, and it's a subset of the Astro Center at A&M. Um, so what exactly is spacecraft? So spacecraft has been designed to be an online uh, engineering collaboration platform in virtual reality. So we're putting the correct physics into the VR universe um, so that the engineering system designs uh, can be evaluated and tested with a human in the loop uh, in the actual environment uh, that they'll be operating. So we have many different types of um, detailed models. These range from planetary surfaces to robots and habitats. Um, but in addition to that, we're simulating the orbital mechanics, uh, putting dynamic models to all these 3D models, um, and uh, just creating a way for all these systems to interact. And so one of the unique features of spacecraft uh, is the automatic integration of these various models. Uh, 
for example, a flying vehicle on Mars um, would automatically interact with the atmospheric model uh, without any additional programming uh, needed. Uh, the model structure format that we use for the core spacecraft simulation code um, enables these interactions to be more or less automatic. Um, so spacecraft is a collaborative project and our aim is to uh, have collaboration between academia, industry, and the government. Uh, so one uh, example is we have a Space Act agreement with NASA uh, to simulate the Deep Space Gateway. Um, we're potentially going to work with JPL on a CubeSat swarm uh, to Mars. And then most recently we've partnered with the Mars Society on this Mars VR project. Um, so our role in the Mars VR project is to develop some of the functionality that's going into uh, this project. Uh, and additionally, contribute some of our own models where needed. Um, so uh, we're working to simulate some of the preliminary scenarios in this phase one. Uh, and this includes an EVA egress procedure and then also some preliminary uh, rover work. So I have a short video here uh, that goes through uh, some of the work we've done demoing it. So uh, in this case, we have an astronaut doing the EVA prep uh, and egress. We have a very loud bopping noise whenever we touch something. Um, I like it. So you can see that we can interact with the live procedure display in the virtual reality. Uh, and this procedure, or this display rather, guides us uh, through all the steps, um, making sure we don't miss anything. Uh, these displays can be modified uh, so we can add any new uh, training scenarios we come up with or make modifications to ones that already exist. Um, and so one of the best parts of this uh, training scenario is that it's going to be uh, allowing astronauts going out to the MDRS to familiarize themselves with the surroundings and the gear and tools they'll be using. Um, so uh, just to note, right now we're using our own models and uh, uh, habitat and Mars surface uh, to develop the functionality uh, and we'll progress to use the, the scans that have, uh, that'll be showcased tonight. Um, let's see. So this is just going through the, uh, putting on the suit. It's a little slow. I'll go ahead and uh, this part's important. So here, you can see we're picking up the radio. Um, and uh, inside the, the demo, or the, the simulation, we can actually... Uh, com check. Do you read me? Perform a com check. We uh, read you. For now, it's just automated voices on a click. But we can add actual voices, make it more interactable, um, to simulate the whole process better. So uh, we can see here, we're now moving into the airlock to uh, prepare for an EVA. You can see here, we have all our gear laid out uh, that we might need, some digging tools, uh, uh, first aid, a map, a camera, some rope, um, things that might be useful out uh, on an EVA. Here, uh, we can see the, the supply checklist is also on our, uh, on our user interface. And we can pick up each item, check off, make sure we have it with us, and then uh, continue on through our procedures. So here we're still collecting all our items. I'll just skip through that because it's not that exciting. So here, we can also continue forward and go through some of the communications that'll be needed uh, as you egress. Hello, Habcom. This is Eva One. Do you read me? This is Habcom. 
We read you either one. Internal crew, this is Eva 1. Is the internal airlock confirmed closed? So these are just this is internal steps. crew. The internal airlock uh, is closed. Some of the steps for going through and exiting the airlock. Internal crew, this is Eva 1. Requesting permission to begin Eva. Permission granted EVA 1. Here we can transition straight from uh, putting on our suit and uh, doing the airlock procedures to being out on the surface and getting into our rover. And I'll just skip to some of the driving. Um, you can get in the rover, uh, drive it to another site if needed to do other procedures. Um, so depending on how we expand this um, Simulation could uh, accommodate many different um, scenarios at the MDRS. Um, so uh, that was made in Unreal. I know everything else is being made in Unity right now, but we're working to uh, have some interaction between the two, see what can overlap, but also have this working on both platforms. Um, which also increases our user base. Um, so some future plans spacecraft has is to implement the 3D models and scans from uh, the Mars Society and uh, Shannon, and then increase our user functionality. One of the key points for this is creating an inventory system. So those tools we were picking up, the maps and the cameras and the, uh, the rope, um, storing this in our inventory and being able to pull this out later uh, so if we progress to um, another scenario out in the Utah landscape, we'd be able to pull this stuff out and use it uh, to train whatever uh, the scenario might be. Um, we also want to improve our rover physics to uh, just have a more realistic driving experience. Uh, okay, and then we're going to expand into more training scenarios. All right, thanks a lot, Eric. Absolutely. One minute. So I think we have time to take a couple questions. Is your mic coming? Uh, Eric, I've got a question for you. Well, what industry do you want to interface with? Uh, aerospace engineering. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with Titronics in Houston? I'm not. Okay, so Titronics is a, a derivative of what used to be Link Systems that did all of the astronaut training tools. Mm -hmm. And they have a variety of very, very high fidelity simulations, including being able to fly inside of ISS and get close up on every single instrument. Mm -hmm. I mean, as if, but the thing of it is, they're not VR. They're 2D, but you can fly in. I mean, one question I've always wondered, can you make a 3D platform from a 2D space? By, I mean, it seems like it's possible, but if you really want very, very high fidelity uh, training, and it's, this used to train all the crews, Mm -hmm. You might contact Titronics. T I E T R O N L I X. I'll write that down. Because, yeah, that actually that is very interesting, and we could definitely work something out and see uh, if something works. Thank, thank you. Uh, is there a way to create the physiological sensation of 3 8 gravity using VR? So. You want to take that maybe, Shannon? I mean, it's basically our simulation is on Earth, so obviously the gravity is the same for Mars VR. With spacecraft, they do have a bunch of physics-based models that they've already implemented. So, for example, for the, uh, and Dr. Shamatov has talked to me about this, the lunar orbital gateway. You're in lunar orbit, but you're also zero gravity, so there's some interaction there um, that they already have in the model. But there's no, one of the issues with VR these days is haptic feedback. Like if you ever saw the movie Ready Player One recently, you know, they have like a full body suit so they can feel what's in VR. We don't have that yet, yet. But um, so we have to sort of give the user feedback in other ways. Uh, what we may do is have the controllers vibrate when somebody touches something. But it's kind of a hard challenge to simulate zero gravity and 
the feelings of that. Yeah, there, there is a rig, and uh, I've seen it, it's in, it's in Europe, and uh, it's basically a harness that you get into, and it has a counterweight on the other side that's equivalent to your weight, and they can adjust some cams and stuff like that to adjust for relative gravity. So you, you know, you just with a push of a toe, you're kind of moving. So it's, it's kind of rudimentary, but it's quite effective when you're in VR around you. So yes, it can be done. It's not exactly scalable to the masses, but... Um, yeah, who knows? Yeah, Ready Player One, by the way. You guys all got to see that. Required viewing. Really exciting work. Thank you, all of you. Will the future MDRS suits be able to include an um, augmented reality system so that you could take this data set out on an actual excursion and use it as a reference? We are talking about how best to do stuff like that. It idea. would be great for us to yeah. enable a scenario, for example, where the crew member on EVA is communicating in real time with someone using a VR headset back in the hab. Yeah. And they're basically out on EVA with the crew member and they see each other yeah. you know, that, and talk to each other. So they're basically exploring together. And that's also the long-term vision, uh, Dr. Zubrin's yeah. talked about this, yeah. of having people on Mars exploring and, and people back on Earth helping them in real time or near real time. Or, or more likely uh, you'll have a, a, a environmental hab where you can walk around, you know, whatever you call it, a, a hab where you can eat and breathe and you don't have to have a suit on. I don't know the word. I'm not a space guy, sorry. So you're in this, this area and, you know, five or ten miles away is the actual guy out exploring. So you, ha you, don't, you don't have to deal with speed of light issues, obviously. You can't be talking probably to Earth or maybe a satellite up in, up in uh, orbit. But the point being is that you, you have a, a very rich scan of the environment that you can see every single rock, you know where they are, and you can direct the guys on the ground to go look at what they need to look at. And plus they can show, they can go, hey, what's this? And you can run an analysis on your computer back at the, at the main base. Sorry, okay. I'm challenge. I have a question in the front here, and then we need to break for lunch, sorry. Yeah, last question. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, one, two more. Yeah, so, so have you guys thought about approaching the NBL? The NBL does, of course, they do most of the training in the enormous underwater pool, which has got a full ISS in it. And they've got, uh, they're always looking for things to do. So if you want to simulate gravity, any level you want, uh, if assuming that you can uh, adjust this rig to work underwater, uh, you would have a gravity field and a VR field. In fact, if, if you think about it, before they, before they even train on whatever is in the NBL, like for instance ISS, if you were in a space in the NBL that you could do VR or AVR, you would actually see all the tasks you're doing with the gravity uh, imposed on it. And then that level of training would be step one and step two would be to actually go to the craft and then finally step three would be the real system. So I don't know if it's feasible to do this on underwater, but you might consider it. Thanks. Question? Um, yes, I, th I think it will be interesting to um, see the crisis situation. I don't know if you're planning to simulate, like something goes wrong and you have to make a decision, decision whether your colleague astronaut dies or the rocket explodes and see how that feels. Uh, are you planning to... Uh, so we, we have a set of training scenarios that we've worked on with Dr. Rupert already. And that some of that was in the demo that is in Spacecraft VR. The, some of the same script for going on EVA is what they use at Texas A&M. It's based on the work that Dr. Rupert and I put together for that. We don't currently have a crisis scenario. I think it's a good idea. We're going to grow the amount of training we have over time. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to focus on the basics like where stuff is at the MDRS so that the crew members know ahead of time. Uh, they can just hit the ground running when they get out there because they've done the training in VR or on their computer before they arrive at MDRS. Um, so we're focusing on that for phase one and then we'll add to that in the future. But I think the fundamentals are that VR is, is absolutely a part of the space industry moving forward. There, that is the way to train for missions beforehand. It's ridiculous to have to build an exact analog copy of the ISS just to train in on a it. swimming pool in a swimming pool right i mean yes as the final training makes sense but the initial phases you you know you've already got the 3d models of these things of the the bases or the the spacecraft etc so 
make those available in VR for the training, I mean, for astronauts. Like, use, it, use VR as an actual scientific instrument. I think that's the end goal of this project, is to prove that it can be done. And, and that's the reason also why we're open sourcing the MDRS models is because we want them to be available widely for various purposes, for public outreach, for STEM education, and just telling the story of what we're doing at the MDRS. All right, Th thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. So